Renewables training. How does a heat pump work? My name is Alan Hart and in today's video we've got a special guest today. We've got Adam from Heat Geek and he's put a, he's done a video for us on how a heat pump works. So he's going to go through some of the figures and, and, and what you need to prepare to if you're going to be changing over and if you're going to start installing heat pumps then hopefully this will be a very interesting video for you. Please, as always, ask some questions below, put some thumbs up. Um, yeah, um, just one thing I wanted to point out with this video, Adam, Heat Geek, um, they've done a donation to the charity. So if you just look there, they've just done a, uh, a charity donation to Candlelighters to help with the journey that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to do. Um, and that, that that journey is I'm going to try and raise a million pound in total for for candle lighters. I'm not saying I'm going to do that, but I'm going to try my best to do that. So without further ado, let's go over. Let's go over to Adam. Hi, Alan. Um, thanks for inviting us along to contribute. Uh, great channel uh, and just really impressive stuff you're doing with the candle lighters. I, I really hope this helps in some small way. So today we're going to talk about heat pumps. Uh, how they work, how we can make them most efficient, and why we're going to start impl uh, implementing them in the UK. So why do we want to move over from gas boilers to heat pumps? Well, put very simply, for every one kilo of gas energy we put into a boiler, we get around about 0.9 kilowatts of thermal energy back out. With heat pumps, for every one kilowatt of electrical energy we put in, we get between two and five kilowatts of thermal energy back out. And that's obviously going towards reducing the demand on our grid and lowering our carbon footprint as a country. So this is known as our COP, or coefficient of performance. We have COPs typically between two and five. Two meaning for every one kilowatt in, two kilowatts of thermal energy are output. So with gas boilers you can pretty much just plonk them on the wall and you're gonna get this 90% efficiency. There's not really that much you can do apart from some controls efficiencies uh, uh, to boost up from that. However with heat pumps design, installation and commissioning is absolutely crucial because this is a huge variable and that's what we're going to talk about today. How we're going to get from this to this. If these aren't installed properly, these can even go sub to, which is obviously not desirable. So what can we do and what's in our arsenal to get as close to this five, copper five as possible? Well, one of the main variables uh, and things that we want to prevent is cycling. And that's where the unit turns off and turns on and turns off to regulate its output. If we imagine a graph with efficiency on, the, on this axis, uh, say there's 500% efficiency maximum uh, and time along this axis when the unit first comes on it doesn't just come on at up to 500% efficiency it comes on and slowly gets up to efficiency so the longer we can keep this thing running the higher our cop will be the second variable is flow temperature the lower the flow temperature the higher again we sit on this graph so how do we minimise this cycling and elongate our run times? Two or three main things here. First of all, sizing of the unit. Heat loss, when you're installing heat pumps, is absolutely crucial. It is not a case of the bigger the better. In fact, it's the exact opposite of that. The smaller, the better. Um, uh, if you put in a smaller unit, obviously it's not going to overshoot as much and turn off early and it will stretch out the run times. Uh, second of all is volume. You need to make sure there's enough volume in the system, either on larger pipe work or with um, larger radiators. Uh, and in many scenarios, it's actually best off to put in a buffer. Uh, we won't go into the technicalities of um, the volume today, but typically you want at least 15 litres per kilowatt. Um, and lastly, controls. They're pretty much essential to put a good weather compensation system on which will maintain temperature throughout the day, not come on for short, sharp blasts. So they're the three main things to prevent cycling and elongate the run times. 
The next thing uh, that affects the COP, as I mentioned, is flow temperature. If we imagine again, um, flow temperature on, on this line here, so that's 50 degree flow temperature, uh, 20 degree flow temperature, um, and efficiency along here. Actually, I'll do that the other way around. Efficiency up there, that's 100% efficiency, for example, 20 degree flow temperature and 50 degree flow temperature here. The higher the flow temperature, the lower our efficiency. So we want to try and stay a nice low, a nice low flow temperature down the bottom here, which drives up our efficiency. And again, the way to do that, weather compensation. You don't want to be coming on and trying to drive up the flow temperatures to quickly get the house to heat. We want to be maintaining the temperature in the house, and you do that by drip feeding heat or thermal energy. And the other obvious way to get nice low flow temperatures is oversized radiators. Again though, this comes back to importantly doing heat loss calculations for each room. You will then have to work out your conversion factors for your radiators to size them for a much lower DT, uh, which basically means they'll, they'll run at a lower mean water temperature. So the lower we can get that mean water, tem water temperature, the higher the efficiency. Once we get up to 50 degree flow temperature, your efficiency drops right off. We're looking at a cop of, you know, below, below two if we get above 50. So uh, that's a key point. Also worth noting, we should probably be doing this with gas boilers anyway because it drives up, uh, uh, drives up efficiency um, and comfort levels. But also, all of this, with the weather compensation, is a really good thing to practice on nice forgiving gas boilers. Uh, and once you've got that down, moving over to the heat pumps is going to be simple for you. Another thing you could possibly do, uh, if you're about to move someone over to a heat pump, is perhaps just cap their flow temperature from their boiler beforehand to see how the house responds. You can see what sort of size radiators they've got and if they're going to be happy with low flow temperatures, which I've not really met anyone that isn't, to be honest. So how do these heat pumps work? Well, let's take an air source, for example, to keep things simple. Um, it uses the pressure-temperature relationship. So much like um, with a deodorant can, spray deodorant can, this can's now cooler. You can feel it's physically colder. That's because it's decompressed. If we were to reabsorb all of that and then put in more gas, this would be hotter. So compressed substances, and particularly uh, refrigerant gases, which is what they're filled with, when you compress them, they get hotter. Uh, when you decompress them, they get cooler. So, using that principle, um, if we take a house, uh, outside you've got a big fan, and that is going to take the latent heat out of the air. Even if it's 0 degrees outside, it's actually 273 degrees Kelvin. There's always thermal energy in the air that can be extracted out. So, um, what we first of all have is a compressor coming from this fan outside. Uh, this is an exploded diagram, obviously. Once, once this compresses this gas out the other side, you get warm um, refrigerant. That goes to another heat exchanger inside that your radiators are piped off of. That just could be like a plate heat exchanger. Um, let's draw a little radiator in there. Uh, the fridge line goes into this heat exchanger, gives up its heat, and it comes out cooler the other end. Now, this unit inside is a condenser. So just remember the indoor unit being a condenser, just like you have a condensing boiler inside. So that's a condenser. And outside you have your evaporator. Now, once this has gone outside and given up some of its heat and goes to your expansion valve, here it decompresses the gas, making it even cooler, so it's going as cool as possible before going to collect more heat from the evaporator. And then in this evaporator, the reason it's called an evaporator is because this refrigerant is liquid here. When it goes through the evaporator, it evaporates 
warms up, turns into a gas, and then that gas gets pumped, recompressed, and it goes round and round this circuit. Uh, it's key to note as well, it's not just using pressure temperature relationship, it's also using phase change to absorb and release energy. When you get evaporation, you get absorption of energy. When you get uh, condensing happening, you get release of thermal energy. This is how condensing boilers are more efficient. The act of what would be gas going in and condensing back into refrigerant liquid releases thermal energy. So that's the basics. You could also have here, instead of your fan for your evaporator, you could have um, uh, a coil going through the ground, either bored down in a big bore hole, it could go down 100 metres, um, or perhaps even more, or you can run a loop through a lake or a river. A river would be slightly better because you've got more moving water um, to help heat exchange and fresh, constant fresh supply of water. So um, that's a kind of basic overview of how the units work. Just to pick up back again on the uh, phase change of the refrigerant gas, if you think of LPG, most people would assume LPG or think of LPG as a liquid, that's because it's compressed. And then obviously once it's fed into a boiler, it's decompressed and it turns back into gas, which is exactly the same thing. Now obviously this all might look a little bit complicated, but it really isn't. Uh, it's certainly no more complicated than a gas boiler. And all of this lot typically now comes in what's called a monoblock, which is just one unit. So all you'll get outside is a flow and a return to tap into, um, and it has all this encompassed with a little plate heat exchanger. And you just run this flow pipe straight to your radiators in the house, provided that they're sized correctly um, and that the pipe works sized correctly. So provided you have sized your pipe work correctly so you can get a nice low delta T across the system, uh, and actually on that point, your delta T across the radiator flow and return for these should be down at five. That's four times the amount of flow that you would get through a condensing boiler. Condensing boilers work at delta T 20 from flow to return. Heat pumps want to work at five. That's four times the amount of flow. Uh, if you don't get that, um, uh, that volume or that um, flow rate through your heat exchanger, uh, this won't condense properly and it's going to throw up um, pressure faults on your heat pump. Uh, so that's key and worth noting. But provided you have sized your pipe work adequately, so it's nice low pressure loss, so you can get a really fast flow uh, and made your radiators big enough, you should be hitting your cop of up to five. That really is an extreme high. Um, if you get really anything below three, um, it's going to be more. It's going to be much cheaper just to just keep a gas boiler if you're on gas. Um, three is kind of the minimum efficiency we want to kind of uh, really hit. So yeah, three um, is, is your minimum COP. So we have our COP, which is the coefficient of performance at that very moment in time. Uh, annually though, we have our seasonal coefficient of performance, or S-COP. And that's how much it averages throughout the year. Bear in mind in winter, you'll need a lot more thermal energy, uh, which also requires a high flow temperature. Um, because of the outside temperature being colder, and that will drag down your S-COP. Uh, but again, three is your target, although there's plenty out there below three. So going back over the key points you want to look at, if you were going to do a survey on a property, you'd want to make sure your pipe sizes are good large pipe sizes. You have to do your velocity calculations, it's something we teach here. Um, uh, you want to make sure your radiators are big, they ideally want to be at least doubles, um, and crucially, um, as part of a heat pump survey, you need to be looking at and suggesting insulation. So, uh, a couple of reasons you want to do that. First of all, if you write a list of insulation, suggested insulation measures for your customer, you're protecting against poor performance because you can say, look, um, uh, we, did, we suggest this insulation was increased, it will improve your performance of the heat pump. Uh, and also, you're doing a bit for the environment. But when we do increase insulation, you actually effectively oversize your radiators in the house so it can run at a much lower temperature. Uh, it also makes your pipe sizes, relative pipe sizes, a lot bigger because it doesn't need quite as high a flow because it's trying to put in much less energy. So uh, yeah, insulation is a key part to focus on as part of a, a heat pump feasibility um, survey. Um, another small thing that you might want to look at is sound. You don't want, it, uh, you don't want to put the outside unit 
uh, if you're using an air to water heat pump. You don't want the outside unit outside a bedroom window or, um, or outside your, you know, your neighbour's window or anything like that, ideally, because historically they have been quite loud. However, the new ones are a lot more quiet. In fact, we've actually got one here that you might want to see. Look at our unit outside here. So out here, we have a new Vader Aerotherm Plus. Um, this is touted as the current most efficient model. Uh, if you listen in, this is on full beams at the moment. It's like a, I think it's six degrees today. Uh, this is only a four kilowatt unit, so it's relatively quiet anyway. The bigger units do use a bit more fan power, um, so it will be slightly noisier. But it's quite clear that, uh, you know, these really aren't loud at all. Uh, this is a very quiet unit, uh, and, and by the time this fence is up, there's no way the neighbour would ever know that this is on. So, uh, you know, it's cold out here, let's go back in. Okay guys, so I hope that's kind of highlighted uh, some of the essential things to look for if you're either going to purchase a heat pump or start installing them. Um, radiator sizes, absolutely essential. Um, pipe sizes, essential to make sure you get a good enough flow rate. Volume in the system, essential. Um, uh, and importantly, heat loss, absolutely essential to installing a heat pump. Um, okay, uh, that's it, uh, Alan. Thanks very much for having us on and doing this bit. Um, we've actually got we've got fuel cell here. We've got batteries. There's loads of other videos we can do if you want, or even better, why don't you come down um, and take a look? We'll do give you a little tour around our um, uh, around our showroom. We've got solar thermal heating um, and all sorts of cool stuff you might want to see. Okay, mate. Back to you in the studio. We've sifted through countless amounts of information, filtered out all the gumph and whittled down everything to the most important bits of information you need to become a master in hydronic design. HeatGeek Heating Mastery is an online training course focusing on hydronics and controls in the heating industry. You can build your ultimate reference workbook that you can use for the rest of your time in this industry. Applicable to heat pumps, biomass, solar thermal, and commercial heating, as well as normal boilers. Learn to select the best control system and best control strategy. Master advanced hydronic design. Increase your installation efficiencies. Increase your value as an installer. Learn at your own speed, not the average speed of the class. Learn in your own time, not family time or work time. Learn anywhere. This is accessible on laptop or mobile. And also, we give unlimited support in our support group. Don't get left behind during lockdown. Use your free time to get ahead. Right now, someone else is learning to do your job better than you. Thank you very much for that, Adam and um, Heat Geek. And thank you for the very kind donation. I hope this um, video helps, helps you with your business as well a little bit. Um, that's what this channel is about. It's about helping everybody in the industry. So Adam's got his own, um, or Heat Geek, he's got his own YouTube channel as well. So, you know, some people might think, well, why would you be promoting somebody else's YouTube? This YouTube channel is about um, helping everybody. And it's also about then in turn, we can also raise that money for charity. So anybody else, if you want to come on this channel, if you've got a YouTube channel or anything really that you want to promote, as long as we can um, help the viewers and also we can donate some money to charity, then that's great. I'm happy to do that. As I say, this channel is for everybody. So anybody who wants to send videos in, I'll put my number below as, no as normal um, and just get in touch. And I'm babbling on again. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who helps, supports, watches the videos, likes, comments, subscribes, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, thank you.